This week we will cover larynx and electrons. The first simulation we'll do is for the laryngeal. Um, if you're going to do a simple larynx simulation, it is usually going to be with just two laterals. You want to make sure that you have the neck hyperextended. A C headrest or better is what you need. On Pixie, of course, you probably need a D headrest, but I'm not going to get that out. I'm just going to demonstrate the fact that you want to have a headrest that will hyperextend the chin a little bit so that you have good clearance, you're not going to treat through the mouth, and you can get to the laryngeal area easily. Now, as we discussed in class, ballpark for larynx, the relative borders is, is you're going to go from the top of the thyroid cartilage to the cricoid cartilage. Anteriorly, you're going to have about a centimeter to two or flat, a centimeter or two of flash. Posteriorly, radiographically, you can't obviously see this on ballpark, but you're going to either go to the top of the vertebral bodies, anterior surface, or split the vertebral bodies. So, as we said, once again, thyroid cartilage to cricoid cartilage, flash, split, or tip, or just go to the tip of the anterior vertebral bodies. So, what this is going to look like, let me do this one, one thing. If the person has broad shoulders or their shoulders stick up like this and you can't get in laterally, you're going to have to do several things. The first of which it will be some type of arm pulling device. Now, there are a myriad of, of arm pulling devices out there. The really nice ones have kind of a strap like this. Um, you'll actually put the strap on, put it around the person's wrist to where it's like this. Okay? The, like I said, the nice ones actually have a rope that goes down, and then there's this flat footrest with different segments to where you can actually accurately and on a daily basis reproduce the exact amount of pull that you're going to give to the arms in such a way that, that you, you're going to be reproducing exactly the same way. I don't have that because I usually don't use it very often, but if you do need to do it, you're going to have a strap around both wrists. The patient is going to lay, hopefully with a flat, flat leg. You don't want to have a knee, knee rest, and I'll show you why in just a second. So you will bend the person's knees up, pull the strap relatively tight, okay? And then you will have them straighten their knee out. What that's going to do is pull the shoulder inferior. You're obviously going to have that happen on both sides. You don't want to pull it so much that they end up lifting up and it hurts them. But you're going to go from this to something like this. So you're just going to be pulling the shoulder down so that you're holding a little bit of pressure in order to open this up so that you can get into the neck. You can do this for any head and neck simulation. It becomes important on the larynx so that you can actually get in here and not treat through the shoulders. Otherwise, you'll have to kick the table and come in at different angles. This keeps it more simple. You want to have the legs flat, as we discussed. Watch what happens. If the legs aren't flat, let's say you have a knee rest, their knees are going to be bent, and what they're going to do is just relax their knees, and then they're going to be comfortable, and this is going to be loose. Mm -hmm. You want this tight, and you want this to be exactly the same all the way through the course of your simulation and, of course, the treatment. So having the knees straight, holding pressure on the shoulder and on the wrist, but not painful is what you actually want. So if they do bend their knees, they're just going to go like this, and they'll just bend their knee a little bit more and make themselves comfortable and ruin your simulation. Having said that, we don't need arm pullers on her. Hers have already been pulled off. <laughs> so, Such a bad joke. Yes, it is. <laughs> a little bit of Tony's creeping in right now. <laughs> I hope you watch that. You're going to then center such that we're going to pretend this little slope here is the top of the thyroid cartilage. That little piece of stuff, ninny muggins out of the foam is the cricoid cartilage. So I'm gonna shoot halfway in between one and the next. And then I'm going to actually just close my field size down. To encompass that. The field sizes tend to be about five by five to six by six. I'm gonna make this five by five just for the heck of it. And 
I can block some of the light. You can see kind of what we end up with as far as the field size goes. I know that's a light field light on a light colored item, but that's what it looks like. So that's ballpark there. Now, I'm then going to raise the table up and kind of go what I expect would be midline between the anterior flash and what is probably the vertebral bodies. Then I'm just going to rotate over to my lateral and I'm going to rotate toward us. Can you? Always watching both. You don't want to run into your patient with your gantry and you don't want to run the image intensifier into the table. You want to be in such a place Generally, you'd be at the foot of the table instead of the head of the table like I am right now. But you want to be in such a place so that you can watch both of those things. You don't want to hurt your patient and you don't want to ruin the equipment. It's expensive and the chief therapist would be really pissed. So, I have ballparked this without even turning the collimator. I have flash right now. If you do not turn the collimator, your flash is going to look like this. It's going to look like a little bit of a wedge. If you turn the collimator, that's, that's, as we discussed in class, there are two ways to do it. You can have either a collimated larynx or not. There's your flash. I'll even drop the patient just a little bit so that you can see more flash. You'll have flash running evenly across the top of the neck. For either method of simulating, this person is now ballparked. You've got it ballparked left, right. Actually, I can probably, now that I'm standing at the top of the table, move it left, right a little bit. She's not actually straight. I broke one of my major rules. Look what I didn't do. I didn't get the patient straight with the laser. I did not turn the neck. I did not get her straight to begin with, with the laser from the crotch, xiphoid, SSN, chin, nose, glabella major sin right there. So now I've got her straight. That looks a little bit better. I still have my flash, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, anterior flash, and probably splitting the pretty bodies in this particular case. Now you're ready to go fluoro. Having said that, I'm going to revisit the um, lecture for just a second. I I'm going to, if you can see, come back in here this way. If you can see, you can see the divergence, the relative divergence that you that we've caused by turning the collimator. If you have the collimator straight, now this anterior portion of the field is straight up and down instead of angled like this. If you are not treating a true vocal cord, which we are simulating now. True vocal cord, a true glottis, has no, no lymphatic drainage. Since it has no lymphatic drainage, we're not going to treat the supraclav. If you were treating a supraglottic, you would probably be treating an entire head and neck and then you would have a supraclav attached to it. If you do that, you want to have the collimator straight. If you do not, let's turn the collimator again to where our flash is even across the anterior like we would for our larynx. If we end up having to patch in a, a supraclav to this, the inferior edge of the field is at this angle. And if we come in with a supraclav, we're going to have a problem. We're going to have a match line on the skin surface, but we're going to have a cold spot underneath. And that's why with most head and necks and anything other than a true glottic cancer, we're going to have the collimator straight. In this particular case, it's a true glottis, it's a true larynx. We're going to treat with a collimated angle so that we have that flash and we can split those vertebral bodies evenly because you've got to have a little bit of curvature to your C-spine. Now that we've covered that, this is the point. Now that she's ballpark, you're going to go out of the room. You're going to fluoro. <clears throat> when you fluoro, you're going to be able to see the flash and you're going to be able to see the anterior portion of the vertebral bodies. Depending on your facility and your physician, you're either going to go to the, to the top of those vertebral bodies or you might split them. Either way, radiographically get that on where it needs to be. Once you like it, call the doctor. The doctor comes in, he looks at it, loves it. Once the doctor loves it, you notate. 
notate the collimator angle, the gantry angle, the table settings, and the field size. Once you have all that notated, run in the room. And the very first thing I would do is mark the lateral. I don't have my tape with me, but we're going to mark the lateral right there. The next thing I would do is rotate the gantry up just a little bit so that we can see the lateral laser from the right side of the room. Now I can see it. Once you can see that other laser, mark this side as well. Okay, we rotated the gantry up so we can mark that because as you can see, our image intensifier blocks that laser. You can kind of see the um, back pointer laser. We'll turn that off. That's what you end up with if you don't have a back pointer and you have the II in the way. So, we've got two marks on the patient now. The next thing you want to do is take separation. So you get your calipers in, you will take a separation from mark to mark. Once you determine that separation, you're going to decide what midplane should be, you do your calculation, and then you're going to set your SSD to the correct SSD to make this midplane. Once you've done that, mark, sorry Pixie, mark that anterior mark as well. Now you've got a three-point setup that has been determined by your midplane and by your depth in and out that's been set radiographically. We've got all the marks that we need. Next thing you're going to do is take film. <clears throat> take your film of the left lateral where, where we are, um, center your image intensifier, set your TFD, and put your marker on. Now, it's a relatively small field. When you put your marker on, kind of put it just above the flash, right in here on your image intensifier. Um, that way you don't miss your marker, because if you put it way up here and you're taking a very small field, you might miss it. That's the only other pointer I've got for that, but it's, it, it becomes exactly the same as all of our other simulations. You're going to take your film, you're going to set your TFD, you're going to do all of those things. Once you have the film done, go get it approved. Once you have it approved, come back in, you're going to rotate around to the opposite lateral. What do we have to remember to do when we go to the opposite lateral other than don't crash your patient or your machine? Mirror your collimator. I'm going to go all the way over without mirroring the collimator to show you what it will look like if we just forget. We did not mirror our collimator. We still have some flash, but it's going the opposite direction than it should. And as a bonus, if it's going the opposite direction, the tip of that field probably is going to be down into your spinal cord if you had your field size set too high. So mirror your collimator. If you do not, it will look wrong immediately. So 13 degrees off, that gives us 47. 347. That's right, isn't it? I didn't do math wrong in my head. Here's our flash. It looks the same as it did on the left lateral. Now you can take this film. Once you've taken that film, you are pretty much done. You're going to take your pictures. You're going to take a lateral, an anterior, and a full body. Something I may not have mentioned at first, when you make your mask for this, Actually, you don't even have to have a mask. You can just take the chin up and, and be able to do this, but you'd be making marks on the patient's skin. When you make a mask, if you use a short mask, make it such that the mask goes far enough down on the neck that you can put the marks on the mask. I would recommend using a long mask. If you have the long mask, it's going to naturally hold the shoulders in place from then on in the same way. And you'll be able to put your marks on the mask as well. If you don't, you'll end up with marks on the patient's skin, which is fine, it's just difficult. It's difficult on the patient, it's difficult on you, and it's difficult to be reproducible every day. My recommendation, hopefully your doctor agrees, is to use a long mask. That long mask, let's say you have the shoulder straps on. Person's strapped down, you make the long mask. Now what can happen, theoretically, 
is when you treat this patient, you don't have to use the arm pulling devices because that long mask is going to actually hold the shoulders in that specific place every day for treatment. So you've got the arms pulled down, you make the mask, and then every day for treatment, when you click the mask into place, it's going to push the shoulders down where they need to be and hold the chin up where it needs to be. And thus you'll have those two points of contact between the shoulder and the chin that's actually going to allow you to have the neck opened up properly and those marks will reproduce a lot better. Let me show you a long mask. I'll be right back. If you have the long mask, the shoulders are going to be held down where they need to be and then you'll be able to get in here with your gantry and your field size and treat without treating through the shoulders. This guy's shoulders are up a little bit, but not too bad. What this does is it holds everything in place. So that's a laryngeal simulation. Thank you very much. We're gonna go over electron simulation. Electron simulation is relatively easy. Most of the time that you do an electron sim, it's gonna be inside the treatment room. So I've got my image intensifier out of the way. If you have to do one in an actual sim room, it becomes more difficult because you have extended distance to deal with because of the cone, and then you've got the image intensifier. So you have, you're really limited on where you can keep tables and do things like that. Having said that, we're gonna do it the easy way. If you have a bearing in machine, you're going to probably have a cone that looks similar to this. We covered this last semester. But I do want to show you one thing. This is an electron frame. There are two notches. Those notches are offset, as you can see. One is offset a little bit more to your right than the other. You also have an electron template. It also has notches that are offset. Please do not put them in backwards. You can try, but you have to, try, you have to force it and cram it in. If you're having trouble, you're doing it wrong. Those notches have to line up with the notches cut in the frame and it'll lay right in there. A couple of years ago, I went over this at length and the very next day, one of my students crammed it in, did it backwards. What happens if you do this backwards? Let's put this in thusly, wrong. This is incorrect. If you then draw a shape, I need a blue Sharpie, I apologize. Nothing like being prepared, huh? Yay! Okay. Blue Sharpies are more easily erased off of these templates than black. So, let's pretend we put this in wrong and we drew a shape on the patient's right. Let's say you then delivered this to the block maker and they put it in correctly. Now your shape is on the incorrect side and upside down. So it's not only the wrong side, it's a mirror image of itself. So not only is it wrong, it's wrong twice. You will then have to redo everything that you've done. So make sure that the notches line up with the notches in the template itself. Let me get a fresh template. My lovely assistant has one for me from, there it is. So, what will happen with an electron simulation? The doctor will come in, the doctor will decide exactly what area needs to be treated. The doctor will draw a circle or some similar shape on the patient. We're going to use a circle in this particular instance. We're going to pretend Pixie's got a little rib met just under here that we're going to treat with electrons, which is entirely possible to do. So, circles drawn on, the doctor says, this is what I want to have treated. What you will then do is get your, sorry, get your pendant. You're going to run your patient in, <clears throat> making sure that you don't crash into the equipment, and you're going to ballpark your patient using the laser. Look at what I've done. The laser is in out to the correct spot. You can see this is the central ray, but we're going to ignore that. We've 
discussed all of this before too. You're going to use your laser to ballpark your patient. Now you're going to angle your gantry such that it looks like it's on FOSS. You're good. This is not on FOSS. This is the surface to be treated. This is the surface where the electron is going to meet the patient. So what you want to do is angle such that this plane matches this plane. That's about there. And then we're going to raise the patient up and hope that we can get 100 SSD. If you raise the patient straight up using your laser and right up until that CR crosses the laser, that should be exactly 100. Let's see. Hey, it works. Now we're at 100 SSD. I'm going to turn the SSD light back off. Now, we're going to go back to the end of the table and double check our on FOSS. You can see that we've got a kind of a clearance issue here. You can't get much closer. We can't do a whole lot of movement yet. But we want to see, is this on FOSS? I think we need to turn the gantry just a little bit more while not crushing the patient. Okay. Now we have all of our lasers crossing. Now that you've got this ball parked, either the doctor's going to stand here and direct this, or you'll have to call them back in and wait 20 minutes while they do whatever they were doing and come back in and make sure that you did this right. Either way, the physician needs to okay the fact that this is on FOSS. You can also see possibly that there's a little bit of curvature back out this way. We can also do a little bit of a table kick. I think that's better. And it actually made all of our lasers cross flatly as well. That's another good indicator. So now we've got this as on FOSS as we're going to make it. Once the position is okay with this, get your template, get your frame, put your template into the frame properly, and put it into the cone. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to trace onto the template what shape is on the patient's skin. It won't look exactly the same on the template as it does the skin because you're dealing with something with a little bit of topography that's transferring up onto a flat surface. But this takes practice and this is not easy to do. What you want to do is get yourself in where you can see the shadow of your pen and then you're going to go until you can touch the template and see the shadow and then you're going to just draw along and since I'm doing this kind of almost blind you have to make sure that you're following along the lines as projected onto the patient's skin up here on the template itself. Now sometimes it's hard to see. What you can do is put your ruler down here and you can see the blue line. I don't know if you can see this on the on the um, mm -hmm. video, but you can see that my blue line is following right along there. So you can use your ruler to help guide you where it needs to go. So we'll just carry on. What you're going to, going to have to do is probably move yourself quite a few times so that you have the proper angle to be able to see what you're doing. Once you get to a certain point, your hand or the gantry itself or the cone is going to cause you not to be able to see. You're going to have to switch places and switch hands. Sometimes you get to crawl around on your hands and knees. Sometimes you have to go from a different direction. But this is essentially what you're going to do. You're going to trace everything out on here. Now, for time's sake, we're going to say, I'm finished. Once you've got this done, you're going to take this out. I'm going to just turn on the lights as we're done. You can see that this went toward her head. You're going to mark on here the orientation that this needs to be in in order to replicate what you're doing. Because essentially, trying to mark match a circle up to a circle, if it's slightly oblong like it is here, you could put it in here, but it wouldn't fit right. So you need to say, that's the superior edge, this is the inferior edge, this is the medial, and this is the lateral. 
So mark as many directions onto the template as possible relative to where it is on the patient. And then you put the patient's name, what you're treating, and what the SSD. Okay. Last thing you're going to do is you're going to put the orientation. I like to put gantry, collimator, and table because those are three of the things that you're normally going to notate during a simulation anyway, right? So we know that our gantry is, we're going to call it 40. Our collimator is sitting at point two, so we're going to call that zero. And our table is sitting at a little over 353.8, we're going to call that 354, just to round it out, because point two is not going to make any difference. And if you can also read my handwriting, it's even better. So, we got the patient's name. Why did I write name? That's Pixie. Patient's name, what we're treating, orientation, SSD, and gantry, collimator, and table angle. Your table settings aren't as important on electron. We're not trying to reproduce an isocenter. You're going to be lining this up every day clinically. You can transfer this onto your setup sheet however you like to do it. Last thing you want to do, take your photographs. I like to take a photograph from the end of the table, right where the camera is actually. You can see how the table's angled, how the gantry actually interacts with the patient. You've got the orientation, you're demonstrating your on foss, on fossness, whatever you want to call that. Um, and then what you have, that photograph that demonstrates all of this, you're going to bring the patient down, and then you're going to take a nice photograph of the area to be treated as well. Don't get too close. If you see just a circle on whatever color skin you're looking at, that doesn't tell you very much. You want to get a nice wide photo to show oriented between her shoulder and her hip, whatever you want to use as a landmark. Now you're done with the electron simulation. Thank you very much.